All right, so this is what happens when dozens of dendrochronologists are running all over the country and in Canada and Mexico over the past, this is probably about 30 or 40 years of work. We've got now over 800 moisture sensitive chronologies, um, most of them in the Western US and in fact about an eighth of them just in Colorado. Um, and I would say of that 100, maybe two thirds are ones that I worked up with Connie and others um, since about 2000 in the Dendro Lab at Instar. So, and this is reflecting, of course, where trees are. You can see there's this big gap here. That's the plains, the Great Plains. Um, there are some kind of outlier stands where you've got rocky outcrops in the plains. You can find limber pine and ponderosa pine, but for the most part, that's kind of a hole in the network. Okay, so here are the ones, and that's not even the full map, but you can see we did a lot of work across Colorado and then made very brief forays into Wyoming before the Wyoming dendrochronologists drove us back into Colorado. <laughs> no, that didn't, we got along fine with them, but they need to do something. There is a little, you know, there's some turf things going on, but Colorado was ours. Okay, so we've got this wonderful, at least in Colorado uh, and elsewhere in the, in the West, this incredible network of moisture sensitive site chronologies, what do we do with them? Um, we make these reconstructions where we're basically taking the, this, the, these time series of tree growth and converting them into quantities that other people are really interested in, uh, like units of stream flow, units of climate, uh, uh, units of snowpack. Um, so you're not, well, 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 we'll get into it. I mean, you're really just kind of converting the units and, and, and then refining the location of interest and picking the set of data, tree ring data that best fits your observed or gauge record that you really want to know something about in the past. So this all rests on like all paleoclimatological work and also everything in geology rests on this uniformitarian principle. Who took, who has taken a class that <laughs> discussed this principle? It's basically the present is the key to the past. You see some process that's operating today whether it's you know, river geomorphology, sediments being laid down and deltas, and you assume that that's what's hap what happened in the past. So you're using the, the uh, processes you can observe in real time today and in recent history uh, where we have written records and assuming that these were operating in the past and explain the features in paleo environments that we can't directly observe. Um, so for tree rings, where we can look at the relationship, statistical relationship and between climate and tree growth over the last say 100 years or so. We can actually uh, put dendrometers on trees and match daily weather fluctuations with daily growth of trees. So we can observe present process. Is that what really happened in the past? Well, you, this is more of an assumption than a principle. Um, and when I wonder can we really rely on it with tree rings? I look at, I, I in particular look at these chronologies. I, I could look at other ones we, we had. So this is part of our network. These are three pinion pine chronologies. They're kind of in an arc around Durango, Colorado. The, the two furthest ones are maybe about 40 miles apart. So they're more or less experiencing the same climate. And you can see that over the last three centuries, they have tracked I mean, so closely, and I look at this and I say, okay, we really only know about the 1900s where we have observed climate records that we can relate them to and convince ourselves, yes, they were responding in this way to precipitation and other climate factors. But the fact that they were also this coherent in the same way in the 1800s and the 1700s is telling me the uniformitarian assumption holds back then too. And we can do this across our tree ring network uh, across Colorado in the West. So to make a reconstruction, um, we first want to identify an observed or gauge record of interest. And you know, most of my work in the last 10 years has been with water managers. So they are looking at you know, key gauges, key rivers, water supplies in their system and saying, okay, here, here's, here's my record. Can we get a longer view of that? 
And here, it, we need to have at least 50 years. And that's out of a, a statistical necessity um, because this is the overlap or calibration period between the tree growth and the climate record. Um, if we have less than that, we're really not training our model relating the two on enough data. And it, we won't be able to make solid inferences about the past. 50 years is good, 100 years is even better. Uh, here from Denver Water, we got a record of Fraser River at Winter Park that went back about 75, actually no, 85 years. Um, it's very important that it be corrected for depletions, diversions, dams, other human modifications. And this shows you why. Fraser River is a great example. Here's the gauge flow going along, da -da -da -da, boom, in the 1930s. What happened then? They started pulling water through Moffett Tunnel, dumping it into South Boulder Creek, into Gross Dam, and using it in the metro area. And so suddenly, Fraser River has lost over half, almost two-thirds of its annual flow on average. Do the trees know anything about this? <laughs> no. <laughs> they are not going to capture that decline. And so what we got from Denver Water was their record of undepleted flow. So basically what would be in the river if they weren't sucking two-thirds of it away and sending it through the tunnel and down Bo South Boulder Creek. So very important that we have undepleted records of stream flow. Um, then this is where, with water managers, because many of them have training in statistical hydrology, they get really interested, get, we get down in the weeds, talk about the statistical procedures, I will not. I'll just say there are many ways to do this, usually it's some form of regression, where we basically set up uh, a model that asks and answers the question, which subset of our network of tree ring data best matches the variability in that record of stream flow or climate. And we're looking for a nice, in that scatter plot in the upper right, we're looking for a nice tight relationship between stream flow and the tree ring data. And then in time series form, we have the observed in gray. This is the Animus River uh, at Durango. And then our model in blue. And you can see, in this case, this is about as good as tree ring models get. It really captures the low flows very nicely. Actually, under, no, it doesn't quite capture, what's that, 1959 and 1977, um, or 2002. Um, doesn't quite capture all the extremes, but really gets the ups and downs very well. And then once we have this equation or model, then we can take the full length of these chronologies, because again, we're training this model on you know, whatever 80, 100 years of flow at the most. And then once we have that equation, then we can stick the full length of the tree ring chronologies into it. And in this case, we had four chronologies that were selected as being the best estimators of past stream flow for the Animus River. So we plug those back in. I think the shortest of them went back to 1470. And so we've got a 500 plus year reconstruction of stream flow based on those four tree ring chronologies, the combination of them. Does that make sense? Um, with the original data, how big is the window that you're extrapolating to? For instance, if you use 100 years, you're extrapolating back to 500 years, something like that. Or is there, is there like a limit to how far you can? Uh, oh, how far you can go back? Well, we're just limited by the ages of the trees and the ages of the wood that we collected at those four sites. Um, so in this case, these four sites were all, at least at the time, based only on living trees. And so they didn't go back more than, say, 700 years. And the shortest was about 530 years. And so that was kind of the limiting factor on how far back we could go in a model that was based on all four. So we get back to 1470. Yeah, so, well, it's the same one as here. That's a good question. It's, this is actually right at 0.9. That is as good a fit as you will get. And more than that, you are likely to be overfitting your model and grabbing too much data that's not going to really do a good job estimating back into the past. I mean, that is really the upper end of what you can do with tree rings. Um, the Boulder Creek reconstruction I'll show later, the, the correlation is a little over 0.8. 
that's more typical. And usually we express it in R squared. So it's just the correlation squared. So that would be 0.8 for this and 0.65 for Boulder Creek. And that's more typical for a flow reconstruction. OK, so uh, we just kind of explained it here. If, if your correlation was 1, then they'd be the same. Uh, obviously, we wouldn't trust that model because then we'd definitely be fooling ourselves, overfitting it. Um, so there is error and uncertainty in these reconstructions. Um, there are three reasons, the first of which we can quantify. Oh, you, you, trees are imperfect recorders of climate and stream flow. I mean, it's amazing that they do what they do when it's really not their job to do it, right? You know, I don't think we could design something that could sit on the landscape unattended for 500 or 1,000 years and record climate the way that trees do, right? And stream flow, they're not perfect. They do make errors. I mean, I, we call them errors from our standpoint. It's not like the tree's doing anything wrong. It's just trying to persist out there. Um, then there are a lot of different choices, sometimes we're not even aware of, that we make when we're processing the data, when we're setting up our modeling environment. Do we use a linear stepwise regression? Do we use a best subsets? Do we use non-parametric methods? And these are subjective. We can't say beforehand, oh, this is better than the other. And so there's, it's not so much error as sensitivity. And it's helpful to do sensitivity tests to understand how much the output can vary based on these subjective choices you make. The third source is that the observed records of stream flow and climate have error in them. Gauges are not, and we kind of have to treat them as the gold standard. It's what we're calibrating the trees against. But these climate records and these stream flow records have errors in them too. You can't measure precipitation exactly, especially in a snow-driven environment. Stream flow gauges have generally have errors of 5 to 10 percent, though that's just kind of in the mix. Um, if the least we can do is take number one and formally quantify it, you know, look at the errors, the differences between what the stream flow was gauged at and what the trees estimated for that overlap period. Um, and then we can use those errors to generate what we call confidence intervals. So this gray band, and that's probably a, a helpful way to think about a reconstruction. You know, we'll, I'll, I'll be showing them as single lines, but it's better to think about them as a gray band. So it's a range of plausible values for every year, given the uncertainty inherent in the tree ring estimates of flow and climate. No, I mean, I mean, you could plot whatever you want. You could plot, you know, the 95% confidence interval. There'll be two standard deviations that would obviously look wider. I like 80% because it sounds like it encompasses most of the error, which is true. Um, but it's not so broad as to have someone look at it and go, I can't trust these data. So the bottom line is that a reconstruction is a plausible estimate of past stream flow or climate. Have you ever read? That's my attempt at, at old tree humor there. It's a bad thing. Yeah. So um, this is in addition to the work, obviously, in the lab and the analysis. Uh, this is kind of our, our end point where, where Connie and I, for the last about six years, have been collating all of this information, not just that we've created, but other labs in the western U.S., and created this resource to try to you know, really put uh, you know, tree ring reconstructions of stream flow in particular out in a more visible location. So people would actually use the data, at least pull them off, you know, examine them. Um, and so we've got data and a lot of ancillary information. Um, this is hosted at a server at the University of Arizona, treeflow.info, and that is also on one of the handouts too. And right now there are about 60 Streamflow reconstructions across the West. You can see they're concentrated in the areas where Connie and I have been doing most of our work in, in Western Colorado and the Front Range. Um, but there will be a slug of new data in the next year or two from the Columbia River Basin in Washington and Idaho. And also we've got colleagues in the, the Wasatch outside of Salt Lake City producing this sort of work for uh, Northern Utah. All right. So let's take uh, actually any questions about 
Anything I've just talked about for the last while, yeah. Um, what parameters are you using in those models? So what are you basing the models around? So I like to use, and, and Connie has this preference too, which is good, because um, there, there, statistically there's so many ways to skin this cat. There's so many different kinds of reg regression procedures and, and other methods. All right, is that a terrible, <laughs> uh, terrible analogy. Um, we like to use just a, a, a basic multiple linear regression, usually forward stepwise. And so um, it's basically going to select, it's going to you know, look at the potential predictors or estimators, the chronologies that we put into the equation, usually maybe 20 of them that we'll have screened to begin with. And it'll say, okay, which of these so explains the most variance or fits the best by itself to that stream flow record. And it will pull that one out and it'll assign it a coefficient to scale it to the units of stream flow that we have. Okay, and then it will ask which of the remaining chronologies explains m m the most variance of what is unexplained by the first one. Pulls that one in, reshuffles the coefficients. And so you end up with, in this case, you've got a four-term model. And if you remember your algebra, it's a y equals like a1, x1, where a is the, is the coefficient, x would be the tree ring chronology. y equals a1, x1 plus b1, x, b2, you know, a, no, a2, x2 plus a3, x3 plus a4, x4 plus b. And b would be your, your y-intercept. So it's kind of a standard algebraic equation with multiple terms. And that's uh, totally off of uh, width? Yeah, width? Okay. right, right. So the, X, the X's are just the ring width chronologies. Um, and the coefficients are determined by the model. We're not throwing any other parameters in there. It's just you know, ring width with some coefficient plus ring width with some coefficient plus ring width with some coefficient plus ring width plus the y-intercept equals stream flow okay. at that point. Is that So here, yeah. that guy, yeah, 1950, that would be 53. And so basically the, the, a lot more water came, it was a somewhat above average stream flow year, but the trees saw it as drier than normal. And you can see it is one of the bigger errors in here between the ring width estimation and, and the stream flow. And you know, what could cause that? I mean, one thing that it could be, because we're talking water year, I could imagine at some point, actually in the southern, in southwest Colorado, you can get tropical storms that come in off the Pacific. And I can imagine, that's a hypothesis, be interesting to, to test it. This could be um, a, a significant rain event that came in September and really juice the annual stream flow over what you would have gotten from the snowpack that the trees could sense a lot better. And that's just a guess, but you're right, it is a, it's an unusual anomaly. Here's another one, the other direction. Those happen, and, and, and generally if you, as I've, I've dug into them um, for the South Platte, in particular, uh, the reconstruction for the South Platte, and I could actually identify individual storm events. These would be big upslope events that affected the headwaters of the South Platte, but just because of the configuration of where the tree ring chronologies, which were kind of on the periphery of the basin, they missed either partially or entirely missed seeing that event. So often you can dig into these errors on an annual basis and say, oh, I can see given the climate of that year why that might have happened. Can you explain again why uh, Colorado on the southwest is the sweet spot, one of the sweet spots on the globe? I, I think, you know, we've got, um, we, we have an interior continental climate. Um, you know, so most of, you know, the state and, and the region is semi-arid. You know, a lot of it is, you know, less than 20 to 25 inches of precipitation a year. And so evapotranspiration exceeds precipitation on an annual basis. 
I mean, all of us, pretty much all of the stream flow in the state is coming from above 9 to 10,000 feet. And the trees that we're sampling are generally below that line. So they're really in the stress zone that we're, from which you actually get no runoff. Um, if you look at the eastern U.S., there's very little of the landscape that's like that. And most of the world, um, you're probably able to generate runoff. And so trees that are there aren't going to be as moisture stressed. And then I think the big three, the Ponderosa, Douglas fir, and Pinion pine, just happen to be wonderful recorders. And we are lucky to have them in abundance and living a long time, like a combination of climate and the right species. Um, well, it's the answers to these sorts of questions, and these are the kinds of questions that we were getting from water managers, particularly starting in 2002. In fact, I remember sitting um, uh, with some of the, uh, the water planters from Denver Water in June of 2002, and they were saying, has this happened before? You know, because according to their stream flow records, this was unprecedented. It was an unprecedented drought on the South Platte River. So, okay, they had 90 years of record. Is this a once in a century? Is it a once in 300 years? Is it once in 500 years? Or is it just a one in 20 year event? Is it a garden variety drought that just, for whatever reason, didn't, really, it didn't happen earlier in the, in the 1900s? Um, so they wanted to know, what do the trees say? How, how does the unprecedented 2002, or if we look at a longer period of the 2000s, how do these more recent droughts stack up against a longer term uh, view? Um, how often have droughts occurred that if, if there were droughts worse than 2002 or the 2000s, how often did they occur? How bad did they get? Um, what, what view do we have if we look at different basins across Colorado? Because many of the municipalities, including Boulder, have a what they think of as a diverse water portfolio, some from North Boulder Creek, some from Boulder Creek, and then some from the upper Colorado River. Does that really help you? Is that a hedge against drought? And then what frame of reference should we use for water resource planning going forward, given what we think we know about the climate change that's happening now and, and will continue in the future? And some of these answers may be disturbing, not just to Dick Lamb. So um, this is of where Connie and I have ended up with, we use our network of 100 or so chronologies across Colorado and adjacent states and do the sorts of reconstructions that I showed for the Animus River. Uh, I've done them for 30 odd points um, uh, you know, in Colorado and, and nearby. I'm gonna focus on just a handful of these records starting with uh, Boulder Creek at Oradell. So this is just Boulder Creek at, at four mile basically. So representing, you know, 80% uh, of the raw water supply for the city of Boulder. Uh, the Colorado River at Lee's Ferry, again, representing the whole of the upper Colorado River Basin, most of which is coming from Western Colorado. And you could say the city of Boulder and Denver are tapping some of that as well. And then a few other gauges we'll look at briefly. So um, similar to the graphs I showed for uh, the Animus River, here we're just comparing the the uh, gauged flows in gray versus the tree ring estimates or reconstructions in blue. Um, you know, the, the Colorado River one is a, is a little better uh, than for Boulder Creek. Usually you get a better fit with a larger basin. And actually the flow, MAF, million acre feet. Um, acre feet, 325,000 gallons, about what two families, urban families will use in a year. Um, Boulder Creek is about one two hundredth the size of, of the Colorado River, at least ferry. What's interesting is how closely they track, especially in terms of the very low flow years. In fact, if you look at the five lowest flow years, they share three of them. If you think about it, it makes sense because the weather, the climate systems, the, actually the individual storm systems that put water into the headwaters of the upper Colorado River Basin, most of those are going to spill over and dump snow and, and moisture into the headwaters of Boulder Creek just on the other side of the divide. So there's a lot of spatial coherence between the western slope and at least the highest elevations of the Front Range. And you see that in, in this record. And you also see the, uh, the relatively higher flows in the 19 teens and 20s, the 1930s drought, 1950s drought, in the low flows in the 2000s. 
So what do these look like in a longer context? Um, here we're just we're looking at the annual flows, and uh, it's, I tried to pick out at least the lowest flows. And so again, these are the five lowest reconstructed flows for the last more or less 500 years. So the Boulder Creek reconstruction only goes back to 1566. The Colorado River one goes back much further. We'll see the full length in a bit, but I'm cutting it off at 1500 to be able to compare it kind of on the same basis. We can see that for both, 2002 is in the lowest five. So clearly it was a very significant drought event, um, single year drought, even in a 500 year context. Um, again, we can see that in this case, four, four of the five lowest flows on a 500 year basis are shared between these two. So if you've got very dry conditions in the Colorado River headwaters, and this is across all of Western Colorado really, um, it's likely to be very, very dry in Boulder Creek headwaters. So Colorado River water is not really a hedge against drought in Boulder Creek. I'm not saying, I think the, the water managers for Boulder are more sophisticated than that, they know that. This just confirms that on a, on a longer time scale. It also shows that things can get worse in 2002, particularly 1685 in the Colorado River. Uh, 1851 is the lowest flow in Boulder Creek, but they don't seem to get much worse. And really, if we consider the uncertainty in the reconstruction, it's very hard to distinguish among those bottom five. So 2002 is very close to a worst case scenario uh, for a single year drought. Um, but because we have reservoirs, uh, you know, we've got Barker Reservoir, Silver Lake in, in Boulder Creek, and of course, the big main stem reservoirs in the Colorado, annual drought is not as serious as multi-year drought. Um, and so here we're looking at five-year running means. So we're isolating, you know, really dry and wet periods that last, you know, longer than three years. And, and, and those that were, are more likely to cause stress on systems that have multi-year storage, like both Boulder Creek and the Colorado River. Um, but we notice the same principle, that when you've got multi-year drought on Boulder Creek, um, it's, it's happening in, in Western Colorado as well. Um, and we do see droughts um, before 1900 that look a lot worse than anything that's been experienced since, including the 2000s. Um, so we've got this very long extended dry period with really two peaks or two bottoms um, right before 1900 in the upper Colorado. Um, both systems are experiencing very sharp, severe drought over about a five year span. In the 1840s, in fact, that was the worst or, or lowest five-year cumulative flow on Boulder Creek. On the Colorado River, it was here in the late 1500s. This is also known as the 16th century mega drought because it affected virtually all of Western North America for all or parts of the period from about 1570 to 1600. Um, so there were very persistent likely La Nina-like conditions in the tropical Pacific over that 30 year time span that caused storm tracks to just avoid the Western US like the plague for a lot of that period and you ended up with very low flows. You can see it in, in Boulder Creek as well, though the drop was not as severe. Um, if you kind of follow the yellow bars down, you see that virtually all of the multi severe multi-year droughts are seen in both basins. Also notice the anomalous nature of that wet period in the early 1900s. You know, the basis for the, the mistaken basis, you might say, for the Colorado River Compact, you also see it in Boulder Creek. Okay, so here's that full 1,200 plus year record of Colorado River stream flow. And here, just so we can, it's still kind of noisy to look at, um, I've put a 10 year running mean on it. Um, and that's actually useful because of the incredible storage that we've got in Lake Mead and Lake Powell and Flaming Gorge and the other reservoirs in the Colorado River Basin. They can store four times the annual flow of the river. That's a huge storage factor compared to other basins in the western U.S. It's about the biggest for any large river. But you have a severe enough drought on a 10 year or longer time span, you will drain those reservoirs. We, we're seeing that in the 2000s where we got um, you know, Lake Powell down to a third full and Lake Mead down to half full. Powell has come back, Mead's still dragging. Um, but again, our frame of reference, uh, this gray 
rectangle in the 2000s, uh, what we notice is, yeah, we do have this dry period mid-century. That's the combination of, say, the 1930s and the 1950s drought, um, slightly wetter 1940s. We have two pretty extraordinary wet periods, even on a 1,200-year basis, that occurred in the 20th century, the early 1900s and then the 80s. Um, so our frame of reference is biased wet just by those wet periods. And then we do have this drought. And then the 2000s certainly has been severe. And now it's, uh, depending on how you look at it, you could say it's an 11 or 12-year drought event. But compared to some of these other events that have occurred in the distant past, they don't really measure up, uh, both in, in uh, length and in severity. And the one I want to think about a little more is this one right here. Uh, in the really peaked in the mid 1100s, right around 1150. Um, this was coincident with the uh, depopulation of uh, Chacoan uh, civilization in Chaco Canyon and the outliers. It was probably not the primary cause. We could say it didn't help. Um, we've got about a 60 year period where the 10 year running mean was below average. Um, if you looked at the annual flows during this period, there's no 2002, but it's like the year 2000, or maybe this coming year over and over and over again for about 60 years. And so something like this would really do a number on even the big reservoirs in the Colorado. So it's, it's nothing we've seen before. Alan asked the question, you know, can we match these sorts of tree ring records up with other uh, paleo proxy records of, of climate. And in fact, there are some really nice um, records, you could say event records, that show that during the same period in the mid 1100s, actually for about an 80 or 100 year period, there were trees growing in what are now the bottoms of Sierra lakes out in California and Nevada, including Mono Lake. So 50, 60, 70 feet below the current surface, there are rooted trees still in situ that date to this time. So the only interpretation is that there was an extreme low stand of those lakes due to hugely reduced inflow coming off the Sierra. And if the Sierras aren't seeing the moisture coming off the Pacific, the Colorado River Basin isn't going to see it either. So you have this coherence across the Western US of very dry conditions during that time period. Um, so this would be a, a shock to, you know, certainly our human systems today. It was a shock, I'm sure, to peoples across the West at the time. Uh, we also see, you know, two dry, very dry periods back to back in the eight and 900s that we don't see in the 20th century. Um, it's a kind of another, there are many different ways that one can kind of slice these data and isolate different features of it. This is kind of a little barcode where I just took the, the droughts that are three years and longer. Again, thinking those are the ones that really stress systems with water storage. And so a three year drought would be, you've got below average flow in these respective systems for three or more years in a row. And if the bar is wider, this might be like a six year drought. And I think that's like a seven or eight year drought. Um, what you can see across a big swath of Colorado, uh, Boulder Creek, the Colorado River just on the west slope, there's the Animus again. This is actually in northern New Mexico, Rio Grande at Otoe, but represents what's coming out of the headwaters of the Rio Grande in south central Colorado. We see that the 20th century really is, is kind of biased towards fewer three year plus droughts compared to previous centuries, especially that, that first half century. Yeah, we had dry years, but we didn't have strings of three or more, or at least not many of them. I, you know, a few more since 1950, but nothing like some of these periods. And then very few droughts that are much longer than three years in a row. So again, the 20th century seems to be unrepresentative of conditions of the previous four, five, and even you know, 12 centuries. Okay, so I've been talking about the tree ring record as sort of interpreted in terms of stream flow. This is as interpreted 
in terms of the Palmer Drought Severity Index, so an index of moisture conditions over the previous about 12 months. Even though it's a summer PDSI, it's basically kind of like tree growth, integrating what's happened since the previous fall and integrates mostly moisture and also a little bit of temperature, much like trees do. This is work that Ed Cook and others at Columbia University have been refining for about 10 years. Their latest iteration takes that full set of moisture sensitive chronologies across North America and then reconstructs the Palmer Drought Severity Index at grid points all across that same domain, including six grid points in Colorado. And one cool thing about having this great spatial representation is you can make maps of individual years, multi-year drought episodes, and, and really be able to correlate what went on in a given year in terms of moisture variability with, you know, say, coral uh, records from the tropical Pacific that suggest where we in an extended uh, La Nina period or El Nino. So you can really do some amazing things, you know, examining uh, climate dynamics, you know, regionally and globally. Um, but what I was most interested in is what if we just take those six points for Colorado, isolate them, average them, and, and plot them. I hadn't done this. I just did this uh, in the last week. Um, hadn't looked at them in this way, so that was kind of neat. And I would expect that it would look pretty similar to the record of stream flow for the Colorado River. And these aren't independent data sets. They're grabbing some of the very same tree ring chronologies from Western Colorado, though this um, representing all the state is gonna have a broader selection from the front range from Southeastern Colorado and the West Slope. Um, so really representing drought across the whole state you know, over a 1200 year time span. And so I've got the, the annual Palmer Drought Severity Index in, in these thin pink bars. And you know, zero would be average conditions, uh, two is moderately wet, four is very wet, and then minus two is moderate drought, minus four is extreme drought, minus six is you know, quit dry land farming and, and move to, you know, I don't know where, somewhere wetter. Uh, and, and then the, uh, the heavy red line is the 10 year running mean. So similar to what I did for the Colorado River, we can extract those, those very sustained and severe droughts. And, and there's that mid 1100s event again. And we can see it's, it's a little deeper and longer than anything before or since. Uh, we can see some other events. There's the mid or the late 1500s mega drought looks worse than anything since then. Um, you can see the wet period in the early 1900s. What grabbed my eye were the individual years. And again, we have to think about, you know, these are not you know, exact points, but even if we think about the error bars around them, what struck, stuck out to me is that in the 1900s, we don't have anything below minus five. Um, and I put in the, the instrumental Palmer Drought Severity Index for 2002, which was about minus 4.5. So about the most extreme value in the last 100 plus years, which cor corresponds with the stream flow. But then we're looking on this, we're looking across Colorado, so we're pulling in more tree ring information. And what this is saying is, if we look at all the corners of the state, really probably pulling in most of the tree ring data for Colorado and the surrounding states, there are a lot of years prior to 1900 that look significantly worse. Um, so 2002 may not be the bottom if we look on a statewide basis. And we see some of the usual suspects, 1685, 1654. Um, and these are also, I was going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, fire records, which we can also get from tree rings, records of past fire stretching back, you know, at least several hundred years. And as you would suspect, um, and we experienced this firsthand in 2002, when we have extreme drought years, we are very likely to have landscape scale fire across Colorado and the interior west. Um, 1851 was such a year, 1685 and 1654, there was a lot of fire right here in Boulder County. And so these extreme drought years, you know, the ones below minus four are the ones where we're very likely to have, you know, extreme fire events as well. And it is kind of a little disquieting that we've got, 
you know, something like 25 of these years below minus 5 prior to 1900 and none since. Yeah, yeah, it, it, and if I, if I had drawn a trend line instead of just this line at zero, you can see that going back in time, it does start to dip down. The average does, like if you plotted, say, the 100 or 200 year average, it starts to slide a little below zero going back. And we would really have to look at the distribution of values in each time slice to say, is it being driven by a lack of wet years or by really dry years? And I'm not entirely sure, but that would be a really interesting thing to look at, is, is the distribution of drought values changing as you go back in time? I'm sure it is. Is it changing in a systematic way? Maybe. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, so, so the upshot, kind of a couple messages, thinking back to those questions I posed. Um, I, I, Hopefully I've demonstrated that the, the range of past natural variability in, in climate, well, climate related to water and, and, and water supply itself, particularly in terms of severe droughts, that range is larger if we take that longer view back in time before 1900. And, and the 20th century was you know, not necessarily representative of the, the distribution of events, particularly severe droughts, that we see if we look back further in the triering record. Um, the two, that said, the 2002 uh, event as a single year, and a little less so if we look at multiple years in the 2000s, they sit you know, close to the bottom of that range of variability. So they're close to a worst case scenario, depending on what part of Colorado you look at and how, how much you, you kind of average together spatially. Um, so e even without considering climate change, and really we've just been kind of looking you know, sort of myopically just back in the past from, you know, 2011 back, even if we don't consider future climate change, we, we'd still want to prepare for conditions worse than the 2000s. If they've happened in the past, there's no reason those same climate dynamics couldn't recur. Um, and that question of uh, does a diverse portfolio spatially hedge against drought, having water coming from different basins? And the answer really is no. At severe sustained droughts, the worse the drought, the more likely it is to affect you know, really all parts of Colorado simultaneously. I think we learned that in 2002. We may be learning it again this year. How about if you go, you go into Wyoming on the, uh, the Green River? Mm -hmm. Do you have any experience there? Uh, I have not worked up records from there. Um, uh, Glenn Tootle, Steve Gray, and his crew uh, worked up about eight streamflow reconstructions. Those are on tree flow. They tend not to be as high quality. It's a little moisture climate. You don't get quite the, the signal there. But it's a, you've got a great question there, which is do those droughts, if we isolate, say, the upper Green River, do we see the same droughts? I would guess yes. But at some point as you go north, you're kind of getting into a transition area where uh, El Nino-La Nina affects that differently than Colorado and points south. So it's a good question. Oh, um, yeah, right, right, the, 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 the million pipeline. And is that really true? I would guess not. And I'm trying to think, I don't have a graphic of the Green River. I could, we, afterwards, we, if we can get internet in here, I should be able to. We could pull that up pretty quick. If you go to TreeFlow now, Alan could answer this while I keep talking. <laughs> no, you listen, and we'll figure it out later. So obviously we've got information that's relevant to water management. Uh, how is this information being applied? And you know, application is a pretty loose term. I mean, we've had people, you know, Rio Grande Water Conservancy District wanted us to make a brochure that they could give to their water users and, and, and say, hey, um, you know, think before you put another deep you know, well into our groundwater, which is connected to the Rio Grande, because the 20th century you know, is not necessarily the full range of variability on, on our system. So they were using it just in, in an educational manner, kind of as a, just a, a visual tool to help convey a message to their stakeholders. Um, the kinds of, so the, the applications vary uh, according to the users. It's a very partial list. 
of water entities at state, local, and federal level across the West. You know, here I'm focusing on Colorado. There are others in California and Arizona that have been using this data. And uses and applications, again, occur at, at multiple levels of sophistication and intensity. Um, this is one of the, the classic ones that, that Denver Water did in 2006, where we gave them two reconstructions of stream flow that went back at least to 1630. Uh, one for the Upper South Platte, uh, where they get roughly half of their water supply, and one for the Colorado River headwaters, where they get the other half. And there are differences between those reconstructions, so it was helpful to use both. Uh, they had to do a little statistical noodling to use those as inputs to their very complicated water system model. But once they had that run in, they could ask what would happen if those droughts of the distant past recurred and what would the specific impacts be on their system? And here they're looking at how full their reservoirs would be. So the combination of Dillon Reservoir and 11 Mile and, and, and so forth. And this was their worst case, I guess it's still the worst case scenario on their system in the 1950s, what they call their design drought. Uh, where they got below 20% of system contents under these policy conditions and demand conditions. 2000s was not quite as bad, but very close. And what they found is there were two droughts in the tree ring record that had a larger impact on their system. Uh, and specifically this one, which showed up in Boulder Creek and in uh, the Colorado River. It's that one from 1844 to 1848 just long enough and, and very severe to really knock their system down. And uh, the engineer we worked with on this said, you know, no matter what it looks like, there's actually a little daylight underneath that bar. We didn't quite touch their strategic reserve. And I said, well, Steve, what happens if you take into account the uncertainty in the reconstruction? You know, like, oh. <laughs> he, he, he saw this as, as kind of a, uh, you know, vote of confidence in their system and the policies that they were using and their drought restrictions. And I said, well, okay. That's one realization of potential past climate. You add another 5%. But anyway, it was close enough that they felt this was a, it was a good test. I mean, that's what they were trying to do ultimately, is test their system under conditions harsher than they had experienced during the last 100 years. Uh, Bureau of Reclamation, similarly, but on a, on a larger scale. Here they're looking at what would happen to Lake Powell and Lake Mead during that 1100s mega drought. Um, so they've put it in terms of 2005, they've acted as though it's a future scenario, but this is really the years from about 1130 to 1190, being run through their very complicated system model. And what they found was in order to keep the level of Lake Mead above the water intakes for the city of Las Vegas, they had to let Powell drop below the power pool, so where it could produce hydropower for about 30 years during that drought. And that's a very bad outcome because that produces a lot, you know, however many megawatts of power that is used even here in Colorado. Um, so that was a, an unpleasant outcome. So those are the kinds of exercises that these water systems or these water entities are doing with these data as saying, okay, here are reconstructions, we think robust reconstructions of what happened in the past could happen again. What does our system do under these conditions? So here we are, you know, heading into this uncertain but uh, clearly changing climate. How does this information help us, uh, both in a kind of a strategic planning framework or just, just thinking about, it, just apprehending this, this uncertainty going forward? given the way the climate is changing already and the way we expect it to change in the next 50, 100 years or more, how is more information about the past relevant even? Are we heading into you know, terra incognita? Is the past really useful? Um, so this is, these are projections from global climate models of annual temperatures for north central Colorado. So it includes Boulder County, extends under the west slope. Um, and all of the climate models are indicating continuing warming, significant warming, increasing or accelerating warming into the future, you know, several degrees by mid-century and other few degrees by the end of the century. That's a huge change. And it's 
if, we, if this occurs, it's bringing climate beyond the envelope of, of the past. There's no question about that. Uh, to the extent that we have reconstructed temperatures from trees, I haven't talked about that because I've not worked on that myself. Um, we have find multiple indicators, you know, not as strong as the indicators of drought that I've shown you, that the temperatures of the last 50 years or so are, seem to be higher than at any point in the last 600 years and possibly the last 1,000 to 1,200 years in the, the Western US and in Colorado. Um, so we're already at kind of the top of, or near the top of the envelope of the last millennium, and we're talking about going quite a bit further in terms of temperature. Um, the problem in trying to plan for changes to water supply is that we really can't get a lot out of the models for precipitation trends into the future. Precipitation is a lot harder to model. Uh, it's, a, it's a much, you know, temperature is almost like one dimensional physics. You have a radiative forcing, temperatures are increasing more over land than water, more at higher latitudes than at the equator. It's, it's a much simpler problem. I mean, you can almost do it back of the envelope. Precipitation, you can't do back of the envelope. You, know, you think of storm tracks, how they vary from uh, you know, week to week, month to month, year to year. It's a much more dynamic and chaotic process and trying to discern trends uh, is, from, these, from these very sophisticated models is very hard. The, the models are showing different trends. Some are saying up, some are saying down, uh, some are saying about the same looking forward into the 21st century. Um, all of them are showing you know, continued variability on annual and decade time scales. You know, part of the problem is there is a, a, a definite tendency towards uh, drier conditions to the south of us as storm tracks generally tend to shift north. Wetter conditions well to the north of us. But Colorado is kind of in this neutral zone where the models don't show any marked tendency wet or dry. So, and precipitation is what really drives stream flow. Um, so here, and there have been several studies since then, but this is kind of a classic one in 2006, trying to use some of that GCM output to drive a hydrologic model to answer the question, what should we expect runoff or stream flow in the Colorado River to do over the next 100 years? Okay, temperature going up in all models, precipitation is kind of all over the place. And if you look, the stream flow or the runoff from the hydrologic models being driven by these two inputs, it really is reflecting precipitation. Okay, the variability and the uncertainty in precipitation, generally all of these lines are being forced downward a bit. Because when you increase temperature, you're increasing evapotranspiration. You're increasing loss of moisture from soils and vegetation. In the absence of change in precipitation, you will get somewhat less runoff. But the uncertainty in precipitation is really you know, a huge problem in trying to plan for the future. And so what we should really plan for is precipitation variability, like we've seen in the past, variability in moisture availability to continue into the future. And maybe you know, layer that on top of or merge that with the temperature trend that it, we feel more confident will occur. And in fact, the city of Boulder, which Yes, it costs a lot to live here, and it's a big city government, but you get what you pay for. And they do a lot of amazing things for a city of 100,000 people, um, including the, the, one of the very first uh, municipalities in the country to test their water supplies using scenarios uh, that merge global climate model output with uh, tree ring reconstructions of stream flow, uh, in this case for Boulder Creek. And so this is answering the question of what happens if you take, this is a single GCM projection that actually has a downward precipitation trend into the future and merge it with the triggering reconstruction of stream flow for Boulder Creek, you see shortages. These are amounts of shortages in acre feet um, during the 1500s and 1600 drought that you don't see in the modern period. Um, they did a long report that came out in 2009. I think I've got that on the back side of one of the resource sheets I handed out. And what they found was that even when you combine sort of the paleo drought with future climate projections, that the city of Boulder's water supply was resilient to just about all of those scenarios, except the, the GCMs like this one that force a, or show a downward precipitation trend. Um, and, and Boulder, I can tell you, is in much better shape than most of the front range 
municipalities in terms of the, their, portfolio, their water rights portfolio relative to their current and expected future use. So they're in pretty good shape. Um, so any questions about that? I, I, I hesitate to, to, to bring you know, climate projections into this because often I'll give hour-long talks just on climate projections for Colorado. And here I'm kind of throwing it in in the end of a tree ring talk. So I want to make sure we're all, any questions about what I've showed? And I should say, I'm very happy to share this, the, the PowerPoint itself with you. I didn't want to make 80 page printouts of it. I will send uh, PDFs or even print it out and, and snail mail it to you. Uh, just email me. So you know, we have this, are there, are there any lessons that we can learn from, from the trees sort of more generally? And maybe philosoph in a philosophical way. I kind of hesitated to go there, but I kind of promised it in my little write-up that I wrote, I think, back in December. <laughs> and I kind of locked myself into that. But I, I kind of wanted to, to kind of play with that and see what, what can we learn from these trees besides just the, the, these data, these time series that we extract. You know, one lesson I get is, at least from conifers, not so much from the hardwoods, um, when you use water, and, and you know, even these you know, arid site water stress trees, they do use a lot of water. They need to in order to grow. They can only create their, their photosynthate and carbohydrate and grow by using water and releasing it to the atmosphere. But when they use it, they use it very efficiently. And they've got these wonderful adaptations, a lot of them in the needles, to avoid water loss. If they're not actively producing things with the water, they try not to, to, to lose it. When they're producing, they lose only the water that's absolutely necessary. Um, they retain the resources in the needles and, and cycle nutrients and materials much more tightly than other trees, than the hardwood trees. So it's really, I, I get from the trees, and again, it's always a little you know, dodgy to, to pull lessons from nature because nature does a lot of things that we would not want to do as people. But I think we could act more like conifers in using water more efficiently, using them as a model. Another thing that conifers do that I talked about is they have this very well-honed system of allocating growth, which is really allocating water. Where do I spend those water resources within myself in these different components? And they're doing it in a way that maximizes long-term persistence. I mean, it's been honed by, you know, in the case of pines, you know, over 100 million years of evolution has honed that algorithm that says, where do you prioritize your water use? Um, so it's, it's, you could say it's strategic. It's not, they're not thinking about it, but it, it works in a way to increase the likelihood of, of sustaining itself. So what would it look like if a socio-ecological system like ours allocated our water so as to maximize long-term persistence. You know, I don't want to get into how we do it now, but of course it's very ad hoc. It's based on um, you know, the priority system of water rights. So whoever used the water first uh, is using it now, usually for that purpose, but those rights can be transferred. So it tends to follow the money. It's not done strategically. It's not done in a way that maximizes net benefits to society or net benefits really to anyone. It's not, there's no thought behind it you could say. Um, I mean, these are established principles. I don't want to overturn, you know, 100 some years. This is the part, Alan, that I didn't want you writing about later. <laughs> I'm not making a serious proposal. I'm just asking the question, what if we behaved more like trees and more like, you know, really all living beings in strategically allocating water resources to maximize long-term persistence? Now, here's the part you really can't uh, bring our current governor into this, he was speaking uh, just a week and a half ago at Colorado College at a water conference. And I, this was kind of extraordinary, not that this was anything new or breathtaking to me, but that the governor was, was saying it and pointing this out. Uh, this speaks more to, to this, sorry, than to this perhaps. But he's saying, you know, we need to drive conservation to another level. And he pointed out that other countries, such as Israel and Australia, many cities use one-fourth the water per capita that they do in Denver, which itself has driven down water usage about 20% since 2000, which is pretty striking, but there's so much more they can do. And so I saw this, I said, yes! He's saying we need to be more like conifers, you know, less like cottonwoods. 
Use water more wisely. So please, please leave Hickenlooper out of your write-up. So um, with that, I, I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, happy to take you know, any questions now, and, and we do have time uh, to go out and, and core a tree before 4 o'clock, which we will do. Um, but, I, Alan. Okay, you can tie together uh, tree history uh, with fire history. Right. Can you take it a step further and think of the insects? Yes. Um, um, so I, I was talking to Alan at a break, and, and well, and I, I guess I did reiterate this point as we had talked about it that, you know, these very dry years where we have good fire records, we see, you know, much greater incidence of fire across Colorado and the West during those extremely dry years. Uh, we can also reconstruct past incidents of insect outbreaks. Not so much mountain pine, mountain pine beetle is hard because it tends to kill trees. And then they fall down, and what goes away first? The sapwood, which is what gets stained blue and what has the, the insect galleries that tells us it was killed by mountain pine beetle. So after 150 years, the evidence is largely gone. Um, so what tree ring uh, science is much better at doing is reconstructing insect outbreaks that, uh, by defoliators that don't kill trees but remove a lot of the foliage and cause a, a severe growth suppression that is actually distinct from what you see from drought in the way that it goes down and then comes back up. And those are often tied to climate, but say uh, spruce budworm, which has been studied very extensively in Colorado in the West, actually is more likely to occur during wet periods. Like a, a wet and, and wet periods on like a t 10 to 20 year scale, not a, it takes a while for the beetle populations to ramp up. Now mountain pine beetle, of course, works the other way, um, where it tends to be uh, much more uh, taking opportunity of extended dry periods where the trees are, are more water stressed and don't have the internal pressure to generate the resins to drive the beetles out. Um, but we don't have good histories, long term histories of mountain pine beetle infestation. It's really just the observed record. Um, you may have already covered this, and I apologize, but is the proportion of late wood to early wood, is it always proportional, or can you read into the size of the late wood? Ah, that was a fantastic question. Um, and let's, let me see, beep, do this. All right, so the question was early wood to late wood. And actually, this is not a great example of uh, if you come up and look at some of these cores, you can see that late wood can be much thicker uh, and easier to measure. Um, so you can, if you can see the difference between early wood and late wood, you can measure one and then the other. So we, we can separate those two in our measurements. Um, do they tell us anything different? The answer in Colorado is not really, okay? Uh, late wood does tend to reflect the summer moisture better than the early wood does, which makes sense. This is what's being put on you know, in late July and August. Now, if you go down into New Mexico and Arizona, they have what we call a bimodal precipitation distribution over the year. So they've got a wet period in winter and then a very distinct dry season in spring and early summer, and then the monsoon comes. And it turns out that the monsoon precipitation in July and August maps much better to the width of the late wood. And so actually Connie Woodhouse and her students and colleagues at Arizona have just completed or are completing a project um, that is trying to extract records of monsoon precipitation from the late wood of ponderosa pine and Douglas fir uh, growing across Arizona and New Mexico. And they're getting some pretty good results. So I, I've been speaking as though this is just an, and the annual ring is, you know, represents annual climate for the most part. But there are places, and far southwest is one of them, where we can isolate the late wood and pull out a summer precipitation signal. So, I can't remember what the late wood is triggered by. Uh, it's really the, um, wow, that might have just went. Yeah, that might have been a bulb. 
guess it, <laughs> it knew. Um, so the trigger is, it's got to be um, photo period. So the day is getting shorter sometime in July, you know, and the trigger is probably different in different species. And <clears throat> partly it's, I should back up and say, you can get false late wood. Um, if, the, if the early period uh, or the spring drought it lasts long enough that it dries out the soil moisture storage, it will stop growing early wood before the photo period would tell it to and start putting on false late wood as though this were the end of the season, but it's only June. And then it will pick back up again. And it can put, uh, trees can put on very convincing false late wood. That, <laughs> especially in Arizona and New Mexico. But more generally across you know, the Western US and, and globally, Latewood is, is reflecting uh, shorter days in late summer.